Her Majesty the Queen arrives to open the new house of Britain's Royal College of Physicians. This is the fifth house since the Royal College was founded in 1518. The warm welcome given her follows dignified and traditional practice, but many of those giving it are engaged in a revolution, pioneers on the frontiers of medicine. The president of the college has said that the practice of medicine has changed more in the last 30 years than in all recorded history. With many fine facilities, such as this lecture hall, this new building with ancient associations will itself help keep Britain out front as the medical frontiers roll back. But it is outside these walls, in the hospitals, the surgeries, the laboratories, that the miracles of modern medicine are happening. As the members and fellows of the Royal College listen to the Queen, the work goes on both for today and tomorrow. No computer will ever replace a doctor, but may take a lot of work off his shoulders. To help his diagnosis, tomorrow's doctor may ask his patient to fill in a questionnaire, which then goes to the computers. Within a second, they will have gone through their memory banks of perhaps millions of case histories, then return to the doctor a list of every condition from which his patient may be suffering, graded in order of probability. Already, hospitals and laboratories are making use of computers for conventional purposes. At what point they can be put to work for the family doctor, no one can say. But the machines and the know-how exist now. Machines in the service of medicine. Here at London's Hammersmith Hospital, remarkable progress has been made in the treatment of diseases of the kidney that currently kill 10 persons a day in Britain alone. This actual patient is having her blood washed and purified by the artificial kidney machine. Although an immense step forward, this treatment can as yet give only temporary relief to a minority of cases. The patient's blood is pumped through a core of tightly packed artificial membrane which stands in a bath of chemicals. The impurities which the patient's own kidneys can't dispose of diffuse into the bath as the patient's blood circulates through the artificial kidney. The treatment goes on all day. Next door is a laboratory where samples of the patient's blood are analysed. The samples go through a series of tests which reveal the nature and quantities of the impurities in the blood. This machine measures the carbon dioxide content of the blood by pressure. And this, the amount of chloride. This one measures the sodium and potassium in the patient's blood by the intensity and colour of the flame burning it. From these tests will be determined what goes into the mixture for the next bath. Every two hours the bath is emptied and a new mix prepared. The patient will have this treatment once a week and for the rest of the time will be able to lead a normal life. Only a short time ago this would not have been possible. Throughout the treatment, the patient remains conscious and free of pain, an historic breakthrough in the fight against a deadly disease. The National Hospital, Queen Square, London. An old-fashioned building like too many of Britain's hospitals, but there's nothing old-fashioned about the work that goes on inside. Tumours of the brain may or may not require surgery. Enormous progress has been made here in techniques for examining the brain without opening the skull. Here, an actual patient is having the arteries of his head and neck photographed. To see them by x-ray, they must be defined. This is done by injecting opaque dyes into the carotid arteries of the neck, a harmless and relatively painless procedure the patient is usually conscious throughout. The camera takes up to six pictures a second. Doctors generally prefer still pictures because they can study them at their leisure, but sometimes they find it valuable to be able to watch the internal processes of the body in motion. For that purpose, this machine has been designed, coupling the penetration of X-rays with the lenses of the television camera. The television screen is on movable runners. The lights dim, and viewers can watch the lungs, the heart, the stomach in action. In evaluating tumours, what is needed is an accurate map of the patient's brain, and that is exactly what this machine sets out to make. The scanner moves over the patient's head, its first task to chart the outline of the skull. This will be done both in full face and in profile, so that a three-dimensional portrait can be built up. Then the scanner turns to its examination of the brain, 
the automatic pencil recording by a series of dots on the skull chart the results of the probe. Not our patient's x-ray, but an example of the end product, the dark mass of the tumor accurately plotted in the skull. A new development in ultrasonics. The doctor moves an echo sounder over his patient's head. He views the patterns of the sound waves on this screen. This invention is a development from the ASDIC echo sounders used for submarine chasing. Should he want a permanent record, he can get it from a Polaroid camera focused on the screen. Any instant of his choice is photographed, the picture developed and printed almost instantaneously. Never before in medical history have doctors and surgeons been able to make their diagnoses from such a wealth of detailed information. Because of this, and the ever-increasing skills of the doctors, the proportion of those recovering from operations for tumors has risen steadily. Once, a brain examination meant that a surgeon would have to open his patient's skull with often fatal results. Now it is normally and only moderately unpleasant series of examinations by X-ray and ultrasonics, and that is progress indeed. London's National Heart Hospital, and here we see a remarkable partnership of doctors and machines fighting to save a life. This patient, acted by a doctor, has a thrombosis, a heart attack. To all intents and purposes, he is now dead. But he's connected to an electrocardiogram which flashes an instant warning. A general alarm sounds. Everyone responds, those first on the scene will be the most use. A nurse has been the first to reach the patient and instantly begins artificial respiration. Soon she will use the kiss of life, anything to get oxygen to the brain. Three minutes without air and the brain is irretrievably dead. Help begins to arrive. Still the first priority, keep the lungs working. Twenty seconds have gone by. And now comes the machine for which they've been waiting. It's going to pass a powerful electric shock through the patient's chest and kick the heart back into life. Still less than half a minute. Now a tube has been passed into the lungs. A respirator takes over from the kiss of life. The machine's prepared. Grease on the electrodes to help the current go straight to the heart. The needle rises to the 400 mark. Now, like a kick from a camel, and it works. Alive, dead, alive and well again, all in 50 seconds from start to finish. A routine that is almost commonplace in this and other hospitals, saving seven cases out of ten, thanks to the doctors and scientists who work on the frontiers of medicine. <laughs>